Chapter 99 Harriet the Spy No one notices the tiny device a vapid blonde of a tret drops which then bounces to land on and embed itself into the side of a woman's boot. Of course that women wouldn't notice how roughly a dozen different women that show up at random times have similar eye colors as more than a few are walking with their noses in their communicators or books of all kinds. Not a ping on the Carib woman's radar as Harriet calls in the location. The information seemed good. The names pulled off the translated conversation that Herbert had intercepted was panning out. The woman notices nothing as something unseen and unseeable moves behind her. There is nothing to notice. The Yaoya and Cloken have both been studied and as the woman is being watched. Her gait is mimicked without sound or sight. Her body language and movements are mirrored. Codes are memorized, information taken in and observed. The accent carefully noted as the frequencies and data on her communicator are copied down. Inch by inch, there is nothing about this woman that remains a secret to her observer. Then she's let go for a time, unaware that in the hidden folds of her clothing, tiny devices have been laid as hostile eyes, hidden by a gray visor, watch her from afar. I've got what I need, I just need to practice. Harriet says into the comms and there's a quick double tap on the receiver of the watcher's microphone. No sound from him as he continues the chase. Then return to the Dauntless. We need to plan out this next move with precision. Control states and she nods before heading to her nearby vehicle and fading back to visibility. It takes her about an hour and three more faces to make her way back to the Dauntless as her paranoia is seriously pricking at the back of her neck. After finding her way into the few rooms set aside for the intelligence division, and after setting some things aside, focuses. Her body shifts to mimic the stance of the woman she followed, then her frame and profile shiver to show the carob instead. Hmm, this will be difficult. I don't actually have axiom-infused antlers. You do face a challenge, young lady, however, it can be turned into an advantage in a number of ways, Sir Philip says as he goes over a printout of the information nearby. His eyebrow goes up as a new piece of data is sent, especially if young Mr. Herbert keeps sending us more information, he notes with a smile on his face. Really? How? How can a flaw in disguise be useful? Harriet asks and Sir Philip opens his mouth to answer before reconsidering and drawing an egg timer out of his blazer pocket. There are three rather easy ones. I'd appreciate it if you could tell me what one of them is before the timer runs out. He says, setting down the little hourglass, and she stares for a moment before gathering herself and thinking fast and hard. If we could get a large amount of illusion projectors that make this image and sound, then we might be able to sow enormous confusion. It'd be a great getaway if they're trying to look for the false carib, but everyone's the false carib. Sowing chaos is an option, yes. You could also use it as a paranoia gambit if you and the woman you are replacing are both on the ground. Have people attack her after using both your disguise and some stealth to basically have the woman taken down in paranoia. Interesting, what's the other option? You use the gaps in the illusion to smuggle extra equipment and gear. No one's going to be moving around the upside of your head and you're expected to be mindful of it. It may be awkward and somewhat heavy, but you could dismantle a gun and balance its parts on your head with a proper frame and that is merely scratching the surface. So we have chaos, paranoia, and smuggling for options. That's, hmm. I want to do all three, Harriet says, and there's some brief applause from an outright proud-looking Sir Philip. Excellent. You're truly getting into the mindset of a spy. Gentlemen, you heard the lady. Get started on an equipment rig to balance on the head, numerous illusion projectors, and get it done quickly. This mission is going ahead soon. I'll have to grab some of the nerd squad. They understand Axiom better than anyone else on the ship, one of the intelligence operators says standing up from his terminal. Excuse me, he says, leaving the room. Hmm, 
Herbert is getting rather good at finding the codes. He's tracked Madame Regards into Miss Swipe's personal sanctuary. It's in a large agricultural spire three quarters of the way up. Apparently, the woman's been growing and manufacturing narcotics. One of the intelligence officers reads out from the report he's making of Herbert's observations. What form of narcotics? Sir Philip asks, walking over to read over the man's shoulder. Seems to be the equivalent of opiates. Illegal in a lot of systems and on most but not all spires here on Centris. Division of laws again. See what they are on that spire in particular. Perhaps there are some loopholes of use. Still can't believe that the debate of laws is big enough that it's effectively different on each damn spire, the intelligence officer mutters to himself. Most of them follow a standard set, but there are enough deviations such as the portions of the embassy spires that can baffle a man, Sir Philip reminds him. Regardless, that just gives us greater cause to pay attention and a great deal more wiggle room to toy with. Looking into it, sir, the officer remarks as he starts researching on a second screen. Sir, we've got our nerd, the officer says, leading a soldier in. Sir! The nerd snaps off a salute to Sir Philip who waves him down with a gentle chuckle. That's quite enough, Mr. Lore. Do you understand why you've been requested here? I'm one of the three best enchanters all humanity has, which is both boasting and not. He says with a chuckle, and Harriet can see he speaks with a lot of hand motions. What can I make for you, sir? As you can see, we have an agent under illusion. We need some items to allow her to place those illusions on others with some kind of control method. Sir Philip remarks, and Mr. Lore considers for a few moments while rubbing his chin. Then he breaks out in a smile. I can do that. I'm going to need a few Kutha discs worth of metal. How many pieces do you expect to need? Let's go with a baker's dozen. All right, that should be doable with three discs then. I am also going to need our agent's assistance so I can get the disguise down on them properly. Lore remarks before moving fast to catch the trinity of coins that Sir Philip flicks at him with his thumb. I'll get started then, he says, walking over to a nearby desk that's only half full of paperwork and placing the discs in a tiny stack. Um, I'm going to assume that we have a miss under that illusion, he remarks, turning to Harriet, who crosses her arms. Yes, Harriet responds. Could you stand beside me while I do this? I mostly just need your proximity to copy samples of the axiom construct you're maintaining, he says, and she walks over. Excellent. This should only take a few moments. These doohickeys will only work once properly, but won't be traceable after. You want repeatable fun, then you give me time to slowly work something together. Oh no, temporary is preferable as pieces might be lost in the field, Sir Philip says. Good, because these work for an hour at most and then revert to charge kutha chunks without any real distinctive patterns. It's the trick of making these totems without binding them to a specific person, you have to accept them as temporary or immensely complicated with an array to cause them to attune and reattune over and over. I see. And how long will this one take to make? Sir Philip asks. And Mr. Lore chuckles before turning around with the stack of discs. He picks up the topmost one and shakes his hand to show the two discs beneath are in pieces. Done. The disc will activate each of the individual pieces depending on the Roman numerals on them. Just hide one of the pieces on someone and then activate it by running a touch of axiom into the corresponding number, Lore remarks, holding out the device to Harriet. Remember the main coin effects, the ones it's tied to. Okay, I'll get something like a magazine or Pez dispenser for these to keep them all straight, Harriet mutters and Sir Philip chuckles. Or I could hide each one somewhere different on me and simply keep track of them that way. She remarks and he nods. Not everything is due to a gadget or do a gadget to facilitate. No matter how convenient things get young lady, you must never neglect the basics. They're the foundation upon which all else stands. Sir Philip lectures and Harriet nods. All right, this is interesting. 
Apparently, anything can be grown on an agricultural spire so long as you label it correctly. There's a refining and manufacturing spire half the city away that actually processes the drugs and it also has a loophole. Our boy in the field is showing a big triangle where all of this isn't against the letter of the law while it thoroughly violates the spirit of it. One of the intelligence officers notes with a tone of disgust in his voice. So it's legal. It's a loophole, like how if someone is provoked into slapping you and you beat them into a coma, so long as you don't pull a knife on them or outright kill them, it's technically fine in legal terms. Morally disgusting, but legal. The officer notes and Sir Philip nods. It was a trick he had to avoid a few times in his youth. The general rule of thumb that if someone wants you angry, it's in your best interest to be calm. There has got to be some kind of law against entrapment. Mr. Lohr protests and the officers shake their head. Dear God in heaven, there are so many races and cultures and religions that everything is violently provocative to someone somewhere and centrist is under the delusion that everyone wants to be here. Therefore, provocation isn't a crime because it's regarded as inevitable. Responding to the provocation, however, is. That's nothing. Due to the way some religions are completely crazy, there are a few spires, not many thankfully, that have it so raping a man isn't illegal. One of the intelligence officers notes, I've been to one of them. They're even more lacking in men than the normal spires, and that's a once in a blue moon kind of thing. Harriet notes, What kind of messed up religion makes it legal to rape a man? Lore demands in a disgusted tone. After this question, you're leaving young man, we still have more work to do. Yes, sir, Mr. Lore states. Anyways, the Church of the Gravid Mother, also known as Gravidation. Basically, one of their central tenets is that men have one purpose in the galaxy, to breed. Therefore, if a man isn't a father, then he's a failure and is to be made into a father. Despite their absolutely disgusting approach to things, they do a lot of charity work and have a massive system for disaster relief set up. They have hundreds of splinter faiths of varying terms and tenets, but most see a man as a walking penis. The intelligence officer reads out and Harriet snorts at the absurdity as she lets her disguise drop. And there are a fair number of other misandrist religions. Many of them are publicly decried for their cruel treatment, but the arguments go back and forth and on for days. Hmm. Oh yes. Some more extreme casts have it so the men are swathed only in white robes that leaves only the upper half of the face exposed. They signify that he's done his dues and is not in season, meaning to be left alone. Any other man is asking for it, according to them. Good Lord, I need a drink, Mr. Lore remarks as he leaves the room. By the by, it would be best if you were to forget what you've seen in this room. Sir Philip notes lightly. Hard whiskey it is then, Lore remarks with a thumbs up as he leaves the room.